world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Dr. Samuel Toth peered over his notebook full of mathematical equations, too complex for most humans to comprehend. Well, at least those that were still alive. It had been 18 years since Godzilla first appeared and began his reign of terror. Although mankind had made great strides in science and technology, they were unprepared for the immortal destroyer's wrath. After the world united its power to kill the beast and failed, Godzilla began to wipe out country after country. Soon there were less than a million humans left on the planet, most surviving in small tribes or villages hoping to avoid the gaze of the destroyer. Now the doctor and the remnants of the UN's G-Force were working furiously to finally rid themselves of Godzilla once and for all. The sound of approaching footsteps caught his attention as he continued studying his notebook. Soon a shadowy figure appeared inside his office doorway. Dad, it's almost time. Everything okay? No, not really. What's wrong? Samuel put his notebook down on his desk and glanced over at the picture of his family taken when Isaac was still a toddler. It's been 15 years since we last tried this. I lost your mother to that wretched beast. I swore I would kill Godzilla, but it seems that demon can't be killed. And that's why Project Phoenix exists. We're about to do the impossible and send Godzilla to a whole different reality. Thanks to your work in particle physics, you've given the human race hope. Who cares if you can't kill him? It's not going to bring mom back. Samuel snapped an angry look at his son, but Isaac stared back with a stoic look on his face. Realizing the truth of his son's words, he quelled his hatred and rage and glanced back at the picture once more. <sighs> You're right. I am about to save the world. Let's go. Alarms blared around the Large Hadron Collider beneath the France-Switzerland border near Geneva. After five years of preparation, all the men and women of G-Force waited patiently for Godzilla to appear. The alarms were meant to lure him to the center of the large ring where the rift cannon would blast a hole in the very fabric of space and time, creating a portal to another reality that would suck Godzilla through ridding the earth and mankind of the demon forever. Samuel smiled as he watched Godzilla come into view. The recent blizzard had blanketed the operations, keeping them hidden from the mighty beast. He pulled up his binoculars, getting a much better view of his enemy. Suddenly, a voice came in over his handheld radio. We're all set here, ready when you are. Roger that. Stand by. Samuel watched Godzilla wade onto the outer edges of the energy absorption panels several meters below the Earth's surface. Even though the collider was powerful and could help generate the rift particles needed, they still needed more energy to increase the size of the portal so Godzilla could get pulled through. The doctor learned this the hard way 15 years ago and at the cost of his wife's life. Now Godzilla was completely on the panels and almost at the center where the cannon rested. 
It's time. Begin the sequence. A dozen G-Force personnel began tinkering and adjusting power levels on the panels in front of them. The makeshift bunker Samuel was in was well outside the predicted danger zone, while the one Isaac was in was ever so closer. Samuel could begin to feel the bitterness and hatred for Godzilla swelling up inside of him. If he couldn't kill him, he would rid the world of him one way or another. Whatever it takes, he thought to himself. A blinking light on his tablet caught his attention. There seemed to be a problem with the cannon's firing mechanism. He immediately radioed Isaac in the other bunker. Isaac, come in! This is Isaac. Son, there's something wrong with the firing mechanism. You're the closest person I trust to fix the problem. No problem, Dad. I'm on my way. Minutes felt like hours to Samuel, who was pacing in circles waiting for Isaac to radio back with the problem. He peered through his binoculars to see Godzilla nearly on top of the rift cannon when Isaac's voice came in through the radio. Dad? Dad, come in. I'm here, Isaac. Why are you still there? Godzilla is right on top of you. Dad, the remote sensor patch is fried. The only way we can fire is manually. Samuel could feel his heart sink into his stomach. Isaac, abort! Do you hear me? Abort! I'm not going to lose you to that beast like I lost your mother! Negative. I'm gonna fire and hope that it's hell we're sending him to. You will die! Out of the question, abort now! Dad, listen. It's not about me. We are saving the world. I'm just one person. There are so few of us left, and this is it. This is our chance to finally have a future without Godzilla in it. Besides, it'll take an hour for the system to completely shut down, and I'm here. It's not like you can stop me. Isaac. I love you, Dad. Samuel watched as Godzilla's dorsal plates began to glow an eerie blue as he roared down in the direction of the rift cannon. A bright light blinded Samuel as he threw down his binoculars, wincing in pain. Suddenly he felt himself being pulled into the air as his vision began to focus. He could see debris and snow being pulled off the ground into the air as if it was in a large vacuum. The thought soon left him as his vision began to fade to black, the tremendous amount of gravitational force rendering him unconscious. Samuel opened his eyes to an unfamiliar ceiling. He sat up on the side of what seemed like a bed, but it was floating? How was this possible, the doctor thought to himself as he examined the bed. Bewildered, he began to look around the room to get his bearings. His head was still foggy on the details of his blackout. The last thing he could remember was Isaac's last words. A raging flood of emotions swept through him so intense, all he could do was cry. The sound of footsteps caught his attention as he looked up to find a person covered from head to toe in a golden and white garment. He noticed that all he could see of the person were their eyes and hands, which were holding a small bowl with a multicolored liquid inside. The stranger motioned for Samuel to take the bowl, which he did with caution. The stranger then motioned for him to drink. Reluctant at first, Samuel studied the liquid before taking a sip. To his surprise, it tasted like water, with a slightly thicker consistency. The stranger motioned for him to drink again. Samuel cautiously drank the rest of the liquid as he waited for a response from the suspiciously silent person in front of him. Please, follow me. Wait. You speak English? The stranger, seemingly ignoring the doctor, quickly spun around and headed down the golden hallway attached to the room he was in. Samuel, slightly offended at the rude behavior, 
followed the stranger down what seemed like endlessly connecting hallways until he found himself in what appeared to be a large throne room. A man with what appeared to be a crown sat in the middle of a row of seats that were positioned lower and not as elaborate. They were filled with people and faces he did not recognize. Some dressed in flowing togas, others adorned with armor, and some just like the stranger who had brought him here, who seemingly disappeared. The man who Samuel had assumed was the leader or king of these people began to speak. Who are you, stranger? My name is Samuel. And where are you from, Samuel? I'm from America. In all of Elysium, I have never heard of this America. Elysium? Where on earth is Elysia? What is this earth you speak of? The earth. The planet we are on right now. This place is Elysium. You are in the kingdom of Mu. I am King Jai, son of King Jin, and you do not belong here. Everything was starting to make sense now. Was it possible that he was pulled through the rift and survived? Was he in a different reality? Suddenly, the floor in front of him opened up as a giant golden device emerged from below. He took note of the large glass structure in the center as the mechanism finished its routine. An image began to ripple into existence as the king began to descend from his throne towards the doctor and the device. Samuel recognized the rift he had opened, although this one was much larger than the one he had opened with his wife 15 years ago. The energy pads meant to siphon Godzilla's energy had worked, and maybe too well. He noticed, however, that it seemed to be shrinking when the king's voice caught his attention. We found you unresponsive, not far from this thing. We call it a rift. I'm surprised it's still open. It must have been hours since before I woke up. The sisters have come and gone. King Jai pointed to the opening in the roof of the room where Samuel found a pair of twin moons hanging in the sky. Coming to grips that he was no longer on Earth, his thoughts drifted to Godzilla. Had he been pulled through as well? The king's voice confirms his suspicions as the image changed and rippled into a scene of carnage and devastation. And this beast, who has now claimed five Mu farmstead and killed more than three dozen millions, do you know it as well? All too well. We call him Godzilla. He's a demon. He slaughtered almost all the people on Earth. And in your infinite wisdom, you thought you would bring this monster here so he could terrorize Elysium as well? We are not stupid, Samuel of America. You are not the only ones who can open doors to other realms. The only difference is, we know better than to disturb the natural order of things. This is why this sort of magic is forbidden across Elysium. Samuel turned his attention back to the device as he watched Godzilla's atomic breath rip through a small village as its people ran in terror. The gravity of the situation began to sink in. He had lost his wife and son in the pursuit to rid the world of Godzilla. It had never occurred to him that there could be thriving civilizations in these other realities. And now he had let loose the possible end to this unsuspecting world. The king moved to one of the windows on the edge of the circular room, gesturing for Samuel to follow. The image of a beautiful, golden-trimmed city surrounded by a lush green world filled his view as he peered out the window. I want you to see the world you have doomed. These are my people. This is my world, not yours. If this Godzilla destroyed your world, he probably had good reason to. But to him, we are you, and now we are the enemy. Samuel stood silent as he turned to face the frustrated king. Now bear witness to the might of the Mu Empire. Samuel watched as the king placed his hand around the jewel-like relic that hung around his neck. It glowed green as the king turned to look out the window at the streets below. The doctor followed his gaze 
as he watched soldiers mounted on six-legged horses make their way to the wall at the city's edge. Samuel heard a strange, unsettling cry as giant flying beasts flew overhead in the same direction. Each creature had an armored rider at its range, guiding their steeds to meet up with the rest of the army. What are those flying creatures called? These are called Gauss, and those are our Gauss riders, the pride of the Mu military. Those creatures were created with the purpose of defending the Mu Empire and have done so for countless generations. They will slay the monster and end its reign of terror. As Samuel looked on, King Jai waved his hands as the window began to reform into a large outstretched balcony. The doctor was shocked at what he had just saw. Baffled, he gave the king a question look, who just smiled in reply as he walked out onto the balcony. You've never witnessed magic in its purest form? I guess your world isn't as advanced as I assumed. We call it science. No matter. Portal magic is restricted in Elysium. We do not travel to other realms, and the Magi keep us protected from unwanted visitors. The king gave Samuel a cold stare as a handful of Mu dressed in white and golden togas filed out onto the balcony behind them. A loud cry from a much closer Gauss filled his ears as he watched a much larger Gauss land on the edge of the balcony, its rider's armor more ornate than the others he had seen thus far. The rider slammed his arm against his chest in what seemed like a salute to the doctor. King Jai returned the jester as he began to speak. Go and make quick work of this beast. May you return with victory. My son. The rider nodded his head without a word and was soon in the air with the other riders. Samuel noticed the Magi had started waving their hands around in rhythmical patterns when shadows began to appear over everyone on the balcony. He turned around to find multiple rifts opening up along the city's edge as they blocked out the sun. Awestruck. Samuel watched as the army disappeared into the magical doorways that closed behind them. He began to wonder if this army could actually do what the people of his world could not. Choosing to wait to see the outcome before he spoke up about his experience fighting with the beast, the doctor quietly followed the king and his host back inside to the device, which was now showing a bird's eye view of the army as they began to engage with Godzilla. Godzilla roared as the Mu army advanced on his position. Mounted soldiers on the ground below began to create magical weapons made of the mystical energies of Elysium. And they had begun firing magical projectiles at the behemoth. Explosions covered Godzilla as he roared in defiance at his newest challenge. As the ground assault continued, the soldiers began to surround Godzilla, battering him from all sides. The cries of the Gauss from above took Godzilla's attention from the annoying ants beneath him. He watched as they took formations that circled him like vultures above a kill. Then, in unison, golden beams left their maws and began slicing into Godzilla's thick hide. Blood poured from the wounds as the behemoth cried out in pain. Moments later, scars appeared where the wounds were, the giant's healing factor hard at work as Godzilla's dorsal plates began to light up. He looked down at the ground soldiers who were still pelting him with magical projectiles as he let loose his super oscillatory blast. King Jai sat on the edge of his seat after witnessing Godzilla's last attack. 
Samuel could see that they had never seen anything like Godzilla before. He began to feel sorry for the Mu people. As he continued to watch the battle, he began to think about his decision to open up the rift. A young voice spoke to the king sitting behind him. My king, we must summon Gamera. You must pull the army back before we lose any more soldiers. Samuel turned around to see the king's angered face looking at a young woman who was dressed like the other Magi, save for an ornate mask she wore. Why do you speak of fairy tales, child? Gamera, guardian of the universe, friend to all children. These are tales you were told when you were afraid of the night's darkness. My army has killed giants and dragons before, and this time will be no different. Knowing that his father was watching, the leader of the Gauss Riders touched the Emerald Jewel on his chest armor. All of the jewels across the rest of the army lit up. Then, in unison, their formation changed. The ground troops began throwing magical ropes around Godzilla's arms and neck as the Gauss Riders attacked from above, their golden beams cutting deep into his legs. Godzilla cried out in pain and rage as he was pulled to the ground. Now the army had him pinned down and was moving in for the kill. Some of the soldiers began to stab at the behemoth with their magical weapons, while others held him down with their mighty six-legged stallions. The Gauss riders landed on the back of the behemoth, allowing their mounts a chance to bite and gnaw on the creature from another world. Godzilla wanted to cry out in pain, but its maw was kept shut by more of the magical bindings that held him in place. You see, my daughter, your brother has defeated the beast. We do not need some child's fairy tale to protect our kingdom. Just because you are magi does not mean Gamera is real. You can't ignore the prophecy. The Herald is here among us. Can't you see? Hush, girl. I want to revel in your brother's victory. The king turned his attention back to the glass device in the center of the throne room. Samuel began to wonder what the young Magi meant by Harold. Godzilla's rage began to grow. His eyes, as well as his dorsal plates, began to glow an eerie blue as the behemoth began to gather his energy. Some of the Gauss began to uncontrollably fly away in fear, while others remained on the down beast's backside. But Godzilla would let none escape. The light from his dorsal plates intensified so much it began blinding the soldiers holding him down. Then, in a white blinding flash, Godzilla released his atomic pulse, instantly vaporizing every last soldier in the Mu army that had been assaulting him. He slowly climbed to his feet and cried out a roar that could be heard as far away as the city. With rage in his eyes, he sniffed at the air. The stench of humans was undeniable and he would make sure they would suffer as Godzilla made his way to the city. King Jai stared at the glass device he had been observing the battle with, his face a pale white, as if the life had been drained out of him. The throne room was silent. June stepped away from her fellow magi with tears in her eyes as she slowly approached her father. The two looked into each other's eyes for a moment before the king hastily left the throne room to consolidate himself. The young woman turned to face the doctor as she removed her mask. Samuel could see the heartbreak in June's face at the loss of her brother when he noticed her striking resemblance to his wife. His heart began to race at the thought of his late wife still being alive. Then, as June approached, Samuel came to his senses. This was not his wife. 
This was not his world. Why? Why did you bring that demon here? Her words stung like a bee sting. After all, he lost his family to Godzilla as well. The gravity of the Magi's words began to sink in. He never stopped to think about the consequences of sending Godzilla to another reality. He began to wonder who the real monster here was. Had they not attempted the first rift opening, his wife would still be alive, and Godzilla might not have wiped out almost all of humanity. And now, the blood of the Mu army was on his hands. And if they could not stop Godzilla, the Mu would most likely be wiped out as well. I... What? Did you think what happened? Her uncanny resemblance to his wife made responding much harder for the doctor. Shame washed over him as he began to question why his wife and son died. He could have shut down the operations, but his pride and arrogance combined with his anger and hatred for Godzilla blinded him. And now he doomed a world that should have never known Godzilla's existence. He had to make things right. I am truly sorry. What is sorry? Samuel was a little taken back. Maybe the concept of an apology didn't exist in their civilization. Then he smiled and replied to the Magi. It means I'm going to make this right. Whatever it takes. Samuel Toth found himself in awe and wonder as he accompanied the king and his daughter down a large hallway with colorful hieroglyphs decorating the walls. Murals of warriors fighting and dying told stories not meant to be forgotten as the trio entered the chamber at the end. Inside, Samuel found an intricately designed fountain depicting a giant turtle creature with water flowing out of its mouth onto a scaled-down mock-up of the Moose City. This is Gamera. The legends say that he's the guardian of the universe, and long ago, he helped shape the land after defeating the great destroyer of worlds. He breathed life into all of the life inhabiting Elysium. So, this is how you're going to deal with him? And you're sure this will work? Well, we've never summoned him before. There is a prophecy that has been passed down for generations since the first Mew. Simply put, one day the Destroyer of Worlds will return to finish what he started. The only way to stop him is to summon Gamera. Wait, you've never summoned him before? Ha, <laughs> it's a simple fairy tale we tell the children to make them go to sleep at night. Gamera has never been summoned because he is not real, and I don't feel like losing another child in the same day. What? Why would you lose another child? June gave an angry look at her father as she began to explain what her king was talking about. The prophecy says that in order to summon Gamera, he needs a vessel to house his soul. Without this vessel, Gamera will be nothing more than a mere beast. It is how we will communicate with him. So that means whoever became the vessel would lose their soul? Yes. We don't know that. We don't know what will happen. Many of the Elders and Maji have speculated that your souls will merge and become one. But what we don't know is what will happen to the vessel once Gamera has finished his work. I see. So how do we summon Gamera? King Jai pulled his dagger out of his sheath and showed it to Samuel as he smiled. Through a blood ritual. Now do you see how preposterous all this is? Just a child's imagination at work. June looked at her father with contempt. It is not my imagination that wiped out your army. It killed my brother. The destroyer is here, and the prophecy must be fulfilled if we are going to survive. Why can't you see that? Because I can't lose you too. I lost your mother and your brother. I can't lose you too. You are all I have left. The king's words struck home with Samuel, almost like a gut punch. Tears began to swell in his eyes. You are the king. You have the kingdom and all of its people to lead and protect. This is my destiny. This is my duty to my people. You are a great king, and it is your duty to protect your people. 
Why is it your destiny? The king and June looked at the doctor simultaneously. Because the prophecy also states that the blood must be of royal blood. Suddenly a voice of one of the king's guards appeared in the doorway behind them, screaming to the king. My king, the beast is here. What's left of our forces have engaged just outside the city walls. The Magi have already raised the barrier. The king looked back at his daughter, whose words still lingered in his mind. She could see the conflict within him as he fought an internal battle with his emotions. She ran up to him and jumped into his arms, squeezing with a little restraint. I love you, father. Go save our people. June slowly slipped out of her father's arms as he looked at her one last time. With tears in his eyes, he turned and left with the guard. Samuel looked at June, who returned his glance. We must hurry. There's no time to waste. June began to wave her arms around in rhythmical patterns as the floor beneath them started to turn. Samuel realized the floor was lifting itself up to the ceiling, which had opened up to reveal a sky covered in dark overcast. Soon the pair were outside on top of the tallest spire in the city. On either side of the platform were what looked like two giant Tesla coils. June walked over to the fountain of Gamera that was still flowing with water, her father's dagger in her hand. She placed the blade in her empty palm and was about to spill her blood into the fountain when Samuel stopped her. June, wait! He ran over and took the dagger from her, knocking her to the ground next to the fountain. This isn't your responsibility. This is mine. I brought Godzilla here. You deserve to live with your world. Besides, where I come from, there were a lot of kings and queens. Statistically speaking, I should have royal blood somewhere in my veins. June was speechless as she watched the doctor place the blade into his palm and cut. Lightning flashed across the sky and thunder roared as his blood hit the water and began mixing, flowing throughout the fountain. June curiously looked at Samuel, who returned her look with his own. What happens? Lightning fell from the sky, down the coils, and into Samuel, interrupting his last words. June watched as the electricity danced all over Samuel's body, causing him to glow as he clenched his body in pain. He wanted to scream, but couldn't his nervous system barely able to deal with the energy surging through his body. The glow grew so bright June had to look away. Then, just as suddenly as it all began, it stopped. June slowly opened her eyes as they adjusted back to the natural light of the setting sun. She looked at Samuel to find his eyes glowing an emerald green. She watched as he walked over to the edge of the platform closest to the direction of Godzilla. She soon followed suit and was now by the doctor's side on top of the spire watching as the army battled with the behemoth. Samuel, did it work? Yes, it did. June's attention was drawn back to the battle as a large explosion tore down the magical barrier. The young Magi watched her people began to flee to the center of the city as Godzilla's dorsal plates began to glow and electrify. She watched as Godzilla's atomic breath destroyed several buildings, causing the young woman's heart to sink into her chest. Godzilla roared with rage as he began to make his way deeper into the city, leveling buildings and trampling those unfortunate enough to be in his path. The behemoth looked up at the spire the pair was standing on and roared. His dorsal plates began to slowly light up, indicating to June an attack was imminent. If it worked, then where is Gamera? I am here. June heard an unfamiliar sound as she looked up into the sky above her to see a giant turtle shell spinning with blue fire as it flew down to the city below. It intercepted Godzilla's atomic blast, causing it to ricochet back into the streets. 
Samuel winced in pain as he jerked his shoulder as if he had been punched. June looked confused. I am the vessel. I am Gamera, and Gamera is I. We share all. Do not fear, my child. I shall protect you. Godzilla watched as his new foe landed in the ruined streets of the Mu City. Gamera roared at the aggravated beast who returned the jester in kind. The two giants charged at one another, colliding with such force it caused a small shockwave to run through the city, blowing out the glass from windows and blasting anything that wasn't fastened to the ground into the air. Godzilla looked over at his shelled foe as he made his way to his feet. He swung around, slamming his tail into the backside of his new enemy, keeping him pinned to the ground. Godzilla roared with rage as he continued to batter his opponent, each hit increasing in strength until he finally caused a crack in Gamera's dorsal armor. The Guardian of the Universe cried out in pain as it launched itself into the air. Godzilla grunted and growled as Gamera looped around the giant spire in the center of the city and began flying towards the beast that threatened the people of Elysium. As Godzilla braced for the impact, Gamera fired off multiple plasma fireballs that pelted the behemoth with intense heat. Godzilla roared as the giant turtle crashed into him, knocking him to the ground. Burning plasma fell off Godzilla's hide as he made his way back to his feet. His dorsal plates glowed with electricity. He stared at Gamera with an intense anger, who was now standing between him and the giant spire in the city center. Godzilla's atomic blast caused a small laceration to the side of Gamera's face as it crashed into the base of the spire, the explosion knocking June and Samuel off their feet. She noticed a cut had appeared on the side of his face in the same location as Gamera's wound. With each passing moment, the young magi began to understand what it really meant to become Gamera's vessel. The sound of Gamera's cries pulled her attention back to the battle. She noticed a chunk of Gamera's shell above his shoulder was missing. Suddenly, another blast from Godzilla severed the giant turtle's lower right arm from the rest of its body. Gamera's heartbreaking cries of pain were interrupted by the doctor's cries of pain. June looked back at Samuel to see that his lower right arm was now lying on the ground, his wounds magically carterizing itself. June helped the doctor back to his feet as he gave her a thankful smile. Thank you, young Magi. I have a request of you. Yes, of course. What is your request? Would you open up the portal to the rift I opened to bring Godzilla here? This vessel is not from this realm, and is not attuned to its magical properties. Yes, but... why there? I fear that Gamera cannot slay Godzilla, so I am going to put him back where he belongs. Gamera's and Godzilla's cries pulled her attention away from the doctor. To her amazement, Gamera was carrying his opponent in the air, in the direction of the rift. Its massive tusks found their way into the side of Godzilla's neck as it dragged the beast through the air using its remaining arm and severed limb. June waved her hand in a rhythmical pattern causing a man-sized portal to materialize in front of her. Samuel stopped and looked at June just before entering the doorway. My child, please stay here. Your assistance is no longer needed and your safety will be in jeopardy if you come with me. Remember what you witnessed here, and remember, I will always be here to protect you when you need me. June nodded her head in compliance as tears came to her eyes. Samuel smiled one last time and stepped through the portal, arriving only meters away from the doorway between realities. 
His attention was taken by the sounds of Godzilla's crying out in pain as the two giants moved ever closer to the rift. He watched as the dorsal spines lit up with intensity. Godzilla let loose its atomic pulse, causing Gamera to release its grip, sending the otherworldly creature plummeting to the ground below. Samuel felt a burning sensation sweep across the front side of his body as he watched Gamera crash into the ground many meters away from Godzilla. He noticed the massive burn marks across the front of Gamera's shell as the giant turtle made its way to its feet. Godzilla regained consciousness as it slowly made its way to its feet when Gamera slammed into the side of the beast, pushing it towards the rift. Godzilla, looking back and seeing the rift drawing ever closer, slammed his tail down and dug his feet into the ground, causing the pair to stop just outside the event horizon. I'm sorry, old friend. It's time for you to go back home. I'll leave you in peace from now on. I promise. Godzilla looked over at Samuel, as if he had heard what the doctor had just said. Its eyes grew wide as Gamera's body began to glow with bright fluorescent red. The guardian of the universe cried out one last time before exploding into a blazing furnace. King Jai and Jun surveyed the area below where the rift had once been. The king tugged on the reins of his golden armored gauss, causing it to pitch to one side so the duo could get a better view. Jun tapped her father's shoulder as she pointed to the ground. With another tug of the reins, the gauss dove down to the ground below. Soon the two were running to Samuel's lifeless body. The Magi kneeled down to notice the smile on Samuel's face. She looked back at her father who was hovering over her while she inspected the body. Jai nodded his head without a word, letting his daughter recognize his acknowledgement of the situation. Tears began to fill her eyes as she looked back down at the lifeless doctor. Thank you.